Happy Wednesday to you all. Um, I hope you're enjoying the little gift that we were given. Just, we want to encourage you to use this at home. You might need to bring another something to take notes with here. But um, I just, as I was reading this this week, when Jesus said to the Pharisees, have you never read? Yes, he knew they had read. Not only had they read, to be a Pharisee, they had memorized it. So it just gave me pause because he talked about, I didn't come for the healthy. In other words, I didn't come for people that assume they have it together. Mm -hmm. And then he talked about new wineskins. And I was really struck with, am I like an old wineskin sometimes? Do I read thinking I already know all this? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Um, and then he's trying to pour new wine in and it's leaking all over the place, not on anybody that's good. But um, so I just, I'm just super excited and super grateful for our teacher and the digging that she does. Um, but we don't want her to be the only one getting blessed by the digging. So we just want to encourage you all to spend time preparing each week and digging each week and um, asking the Lord to make us new wineskin that we don't just read it and think we got it, but we read it that he would change us. Because wasn't that really what he was asking? Have you never read? He was, Have you never read so that you would be changed? Um, and the truth is sometimes I don't, but I sure want to, and I know you want to also. So let's pray and dig in immediately. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just bow before you so grateful, so very grateful for Jesus. Lord Jesus, all that you did to bring us to yourself, to make a way for us to come into your presence, into the throne room before the Father, we thank you. Thank you for your living word, God, that you um, want us not just to read, to get a head full of facts, but you want us to read that we would come into your presence and be changed by you. So our prayer, Lord, tonight, as we sit and listen to um, the teaching to the truth of your word. Make us new wineskins tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, ladies, uh, we're trying to do a new audio tonight because it's not coming across on the video, so bear with me as we get used to this. But, uh, how many of you have heard the expression, don't rain on my parade, right? You heard that, right? You know, that's a, a phrase that really became popular all the way back in 1964 in a movie called Funny Girl in a song that Barbara Streisand sang. And since then, it's become a saying that's kind of self-explanatory, right? It's like it means to dampen somebody's enthusiasm or somebody's joy um, by bringing negativity. And that's kind of what we're going to see in this section of Mark as we dive in to the third lesson tonight. And this is we're once again going to focus on the identity of Jesus here because remember all the way back in chapter 1 we look at verse 1 that that's the theme that's the the uh, overarching message of the whole book of Mark which is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the son of God so everything we read every miracle every teaching every event comes under that heading and it all points us back to who Jesus really is that he is the son of of God, and, and so that's what we've really looked at so far. And this is the next week where we'll move into some of his teaching. But these three lessons here all have the same theme, and that is uh, to show us who Jesus is. And the first week we saw the witnesses and the testimony of others who pointed us to who Jesus was, and that's the prophets, John the Baptist, and uh, the Godhead himself pointing to who Jesus is. And then last week we saw the demonstrations of Jesus' authority that pointed us to who Jesus really is. And that's over the spiritual and the physical realms with lots of healings, very exciting, lots of things going on, lots of things happening last week. And this week we're going to look at the actual declarations of Jesus uh, himself, his actual words, the actual things he says about himself uh, that point us back to who he really is. And so... Uh, just quickly, um, we'll talk about this chart again. If you got one two weeks ago, throw it away and get the new one because something happened between my computer and the printer here at church that did not print correctly, but I've got to print it right. But this is just a three-year timeline of Jesus' ministry. And you'll see the gray here is what's covered by Mark. 
And so we see right here, the little bitty uh, gray right here is Mark 1, 1. And, the first, and then we jump all the way to the second year of, 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 of Jesus' ministry. He doesn't, Mark doesn't cover very much of year 1 at all. Uh, some of the other Gospels tell us more about that. But it jumps all the way, Mark 1, 14 and on. And so we're in the first part of the second year of Jesus' ministry there. And so... There is a big parade going on by now uh, with, in Jesus' new ministry, especially among the poor, the downtrodden, the sick, the sinners. And he interacts with these people very, very differently than the other teachers of the law have ever done. So they choose, these leaders choose not to join in the celebration and the obvious move of God that is shown up in the man Jesus here. And the uh, Pharisees show up at this point in the Gospel of Mark to bring rain. <laughs> and uh, they actually do all that they can to squelch the celebration and to get rid of the celebration altogether. By the end of this section, we'll see just how far that they are willing to go to stop this. So tonight we're going to look, we've got lots to cover, we're going to look at four conflicts and questions that that, uh, that uh, arise around the Jewish customs of the day. And each one of these controversies leads to a, a question and then a statement by Jesus that, where he tells them who he really is um, and, and more plainly than sometimes I think we really realize when we're just reading through these. It's not, he's not, it's not hidden at all when you really look at it. Now, the, at this time, the Pharisees were not seen as bad people. We think about Pharisees as being hypo hypocrites and and, you know, it would be really bad to call somebody pharisaical. That's not how people in the first century thought of the Pharisees, because they were held in high esteem by the people in Israel uh, for their devotion to the law. So their primary motivation, though corrupted, was fundamentally to maintain a life of devotion and purity and obedience to God's law. That's what they were trying to do. And so they didn't set out to be legalistic, but in trying to help people understand what the law required, they tried to define it in a way so that it would be measurable and observable. So they were trying to help people say, well, this is how you know if you are following the law. And so they made all of these layers of more and more and more rules in trying to help people. So for example, the law, we're gonna talk about the Sabbath in a minute. So the law, they said, forbids working on the Sabbath. You were supposed to rest. And so that was kind of vague. So over many, 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 many years, the Pharisees set out to define what work was really like. And so, like, the question would be, is it work to travel on the Sabbath? Can you go from here to there? And if it's work to travel on the Sabbath, how far? If, if it's not work to go uh, on the Sabbath, how far can you go before it is work? So they came up with these laws. They said, you could travel 1,999 steps. That was not work, but 2,000 was. <laughs> and so, uh, so they had their definition of work uh, for traveling then became observable and tangible. So you could really get out your step counter and, you know, if you had your iPhone on your hip and you could walk along and you say, now I need to stop because I need more work. And so they did that to all kinds of things. Uh, like, is it work to carry something? Uh, how much can you carry? How far can you carry it? Is it, you know, a box? Is it a bag? Is it a thing of grain? I mean, what, what they were trying to help people understand what these th rules were and how they could know for sure that they were in compliance with God's law. And then they had rules about giving, about tithing, about taking care of your parents and children. It just went on and on and on and on and on. There were so many rules, it's very difficult to... Um, keep up with it, but never fear. They had the Pharisees there to tell you if you were off track. So um, it was supposed to help, but in the end, it became more harmful than good and eventually became a way that they pointed at other people and said, you're not living up to the law because you're not following all our rules. And so that was the mindset of the people who brought these questions that we're gonna look at in a minute to Jesus. They saw themselves as protectors of God's Law. So uh, we uh, uh, so we're going to jump right into chapter two to get going on this. And at, at verse thirteen and fourteen, we meet another one of Jesus' disciples. And Mark calls him Levi. You'll see in verse fourteen there 
But this is also the man we know better is Matthew, who will then go on to write the um, Gospel of Matthew. And uh, but he started out as a tax collector. And you might know something about tax collectors uh, in that day. But just to remind you, they were considered thieves and outcasts in Israel because they aligned themselves with Rome against Israel. So they took jobs from Rome uh, at, to collect taxes, and Rome didn't care how much the tax collectors kept as long as they got their portions. So they would charge more than, uh, than, than was necessary, and this enraged the people because they were extorting money from their fellow countrymen. And so as you can imagine, this was a very lucrative career, but it didn't come without cost. They got a lot of money, but they were disowned by their families. They were excommunicated from Israel's life and uh, ostracized from all the temple. And so it was, was a difficult life that they chose, uh, but, but gave you a lot of money. So here Mark tells us that Jesus is walking along and he um, he's sitting in a booth and meets Matthew or Levi who's sitting in a booth there. And that indicates that he's most likely was a toll collector and these were taxes that Rome levied against people who were traveling from here to there. And they had to pay in cash at city gates, ports, harbors, village fairs, toll stations were set up all around the place. So if you were from here to there or carrying goods, you had to pay, uh, pay Rome to do that. So it wasn't a peach pass back then. So here's Levi or Matthew sitting at a, at a, 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 a booth collecting money. So Jesus stops at this uh, tax collector's booth, and he says the same thing to Levi as he does to the other disciples that we saw last week, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, and that is follow me. And amazingly, he does. So this is even a more radical decision to follow uh, Jesus than Peter, James, and John, and Andrew because if things didn't work out for them, they could go back to the fishing business. Dad's still going to have the boat. Dad's going to be still be a fisherman. And actually, after the crucifixion in another one of the Gospels, we see that's exactly what they started to do. After the crucifixion, they were like, okay, we'll go back to the fishing business. Not so. It's not an option for Matthew because you don't just quit on Rome. You don't get rehired if you leave your post. And so... There was no coming back to this, and because that he had uh, been, you know, uh, uh, ostracized by Israel, he didn't find a job anywhere else. And so, in the two sentences here, we get the calling of Matthew, and then Matt, uh, Mark jumps us ahead to the response that is, uh, he throws a uh, party, and Jesus is invited, and Luke chapter 5, the parallel verse to this, tells us it's a great banquet with a very large crowd. And so this gives also considerable more weight to Levi's decision to leave everything, right? I mean, because if you're a blind man, you're a beggar, you're a prostitute or something, you're not leaving much behind, right? But he's leaving a lot behind. And uh, so this party is a big to-do, and the people who come are other tax collectors and sinners and outcasts. And this baffles and enrages the Pharisees, because they are kind of brokers of access to God. And here this, this rabbi has showed up, and he doesn't follow their rules at all. He, uh, um, he touches lepers, he eats with tax collectors, and they can't even get it. And so here, they corner his disciples, which leads us to the first conflict in question, number one in this section. That is, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus overhears this. And, and steps in to answer in verse 17. And he says it's not healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And so the answer to this is, why does he eat the tax collectors and sinners? The sick are the ones who need a doctor. Now, this is obvious, right? <laughs> but at the same time, do all sick people go to doctors? No. I mean, maybe you have a friend or a family member who's like really sick, and they're like, yeah, I'm good. I don't need to go to the doctor. Maybe it's you. <laughs> I mean, it's like you're fine, and you know, and that's the point he's making here to these Pharisees. He and to these, uh, he's saying these people here at the party, they they know they're sick. They know they're sick, and they're coming to me. And then he turns it comes and turns it around, and he says, "But you, who think you're righteous, are also sick." You know, you're leaning on your outward efforts to follow all these rules, but you're also sick. Scripture is clear about this fact. It's like, there are no righteous people. 
not zero. All of us are sick. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 goes on and tells us that our condition is, is dead in transgressions and sins. So that's a pretty desperate situation, right? And Jesus said, I, the physician, am here, and I come to people who know that they are sick and need help. Now, then he adds this really important line here. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, uh, so this really freaks them out because look what he's saying here, right? The parallel he's making. He's saying, by saying sick people are the ones who need doctors, the implication is doctors cure sick people, right? And so he, what he's saying by adding this extra line is, I, the spiritual doctor, has come with a cure for sin. That's what he's saying here. And here again he's saying, by saying sinners are sick people, I'm the cure for them. That's what he's saying. And so he's, he's saying that he possesses the power to forgive sin and do only what God can do. That's he's clearly saying, yeah, I'm God. <laughs> and they, they, they don't take well to that. So moving us on to the next conflict in question is in verse 18. And so here the question is basically saying, he says, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisee are fasting, but yours are not? So he's saying basically here, if you are so spiritual and, and this big time religious leader here, why don't you make your disciples follow the fasting rules like we do and like John's disciples do? And Jesus answers this, this objection with two answers uh, and, and contained in three mini parables. So we'll go through these really quick. But the first thing he sa answers this with is, the answer is, this is a time for joy and celebration. Verse 19, he tells them that says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast when he's with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. So, first of all, there were special occasions where fasting was in order. And that's like mourning periods and um, uh, things like that. That was a time when you just naturally, you would go into a time of fasting. But the only required fast in the Old Testament was on the Day of Atonement. And the Pharisees are not talking about that. What they're referring to is these more of these man-made rules that they followed, which is they fasted twice a week. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a fine, a fine practice, but it is not written in the law of God. And so these were more of these rules that they had created and then elevated them to the point where they were used to judge people by so in the service, Jesus is saying here, there's a time and a place for everything. And when there is a wedding going on, this is not the time to choose an optional fast. This would not be appropriate to come to a wedding feast and stand over the corner with sackcloth and ashes and, uh, and be in a fast. It's a time to celebrate. And Jewish weddings went on for a whole week. There's a lot of dancing and singing and joy and all that kind of stuff. And so he's saying... I, I, the bridegroom, am here, and we're in celebration mode. So we're not going to fast. We're not going to choose to fast now. Now, this was a scandalous thing for him to say in itself. It's another point where he reveals his identity that we might not really see on the surface. Now, in the Old Testament, the reference to the bridegroom in Israel is, is not a reference to the coming Messiah. The bridegroom in the Old Testament in relationship to Israel is always Almighty God. So by identifying himself as the bridegroom, he was once again saying, God is here, and it's me. And so, but before they can respond to that powerful statement, he goes on to say in verse 20, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Now we don't have time to go into this, this is really cool too, but this is the first reference in Mark to, uh, to the crucifixion and that he'll be snatched away and be taken away uh, in a time, and he'll be taken away from the world and uh, then he goes on and gives two more illustrations to answer the same question and they both mean the same thing and so the first one in verse 21 is talking about fabric and if you've ever had a pair of wool pants or a sweater or something you know that you have to be really careful with it because it'll shrink up right you end up with a tiny version of what you once had <laughs> and, uh, um, but Back then, the fabrics were made out of wool, and they would shrink up. And so what he's saying here with this, this fabric is, is you don't take an old, unshrunk piece of, of, of patch to put on a shrunken piece of clothing because the patch will eventually shrink up and it'll pull away and make the hole worse. 
And then in verse 22, he talks about wine and wine skin. So what the practice was here is that they would pour new wine into a new goat skin. And so in the fermentation process, wine would give off gases that would make the wine skin stretch. He poured new wine skin into a wine, uh, new wine into a wine skin that had already stretched. The, the gases would still be released and it would stretch and pop like a balloon and both the wine skin and the wine would be uh, ruined. So the point's the same here, that you can't put the new into the old and they're incompatible. So Jesus here was not interested in coming and mending and fixing up the religion of the Pharisees. And what we learn from the New Testament is that salvation by grace through faith in Christ cannot be combined with external works. Because the Pharisees look at the law as the way to attain salvation and right standing before God. And they work really, really, really hard at it. But they misunderstood the purpose of the law. Uh, they, uh, it was not to bring righteousness, but to show you how unrighteous you really are and that you need a Savior who can come and bring salvation to you. Because you can't do it on your own. The New Testament is really clear about that, and it's impossible. You need a Savior. We all need a Savior. That is the whole point of what the law is about. And in salvation, God doesn't just mend our hearts and put patches on it. He gives us a brand new heart. That's what Ezekiel 36 says. He takes from you your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. And he gives us a new nature. We're new creatures in Christ. Old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. Is what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And to try to marry grace and works together just will never, ever, ever work. That's what the whole book of Galatians was about. If you were here a year ago when we were studying that, that's what it's about. That's what it's telling us and exactly what Jesus is saying here. Which leads us to the third conflict and question. And that is in Mark 23 and 24. It's talking about the Sabbath here. And the main question is, why don't you decide, disciples follow the Sabbath rules? And that's what the question is down here in verse 24. Uh, he's asking them. And uh, so let me unpack this a little bit to help you understand what the answer to this is. So. According to the Pharisees, when the disciples were going through the grain fields and they were picking the grains of head to, uh, the, the heads of grain to, to eat them, uh, what they, the Pharisees said was that they were breaking two of their Sabbath laws. That is, they were picking the heads of grain on Sabbath, which would be harvesting, and then they were rubbing their hands together to get rid of the chaff, which would be sifting. Both were forbidden by their rules. Neither were forbidden by the law of God, though. So the Pharisees jump in and go, look, that's a word of rebuke right there. They're, so they're saying, why are you doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? Don't you know what's going on? And, uh, this is kind of funny. I like here this here. He said, he answered them. Now, like uh, Sandy said at the beginning here, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, haven't you ever, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and need? And basically what he says here, because the Pharisees had studied and memorized the old, of the law, he's basically, basically saying, have you read your Bible? Don't you know David is? And so it's kind of a, kind of a front to them in itself. And so, he goes on here in verse 26 and refers to an incident in David's life that's in 1 Samuel 21. And so he and his soldiers and men were fleeing from Saul at this time, and they were hungry. They were without food. They were starving. And so David remembered that there were 12 loaves of bread in the temple that were consecrated. And so they uh, show up at the temple. They talk to the priests. It's like, can we have that bread? We're starving. To death. Now, this is not normal or lawful for David to do that, to, to, for his men to eat that bread under normal cir circumstances, but uh, this is an extreme case where they are starving, and so he eats what isn't approved for them to eat. But interestingly, David's actions are not condemned anywhere in Scripture. So Jesus parallels this to make the point that David was okay to eat the consecrated bread, in this extreme situation, so here, the disciples were hungry. It was certainly okay for them to eat grain on the Sabbath. 
and because they weren't even breaking the law of God. So it's only a man-made rule that they were uh, breaking according to what the, the, the Pharisees were saying. And in verse 27 and 28, Jesus gives us another one of these identity statements. And so verse 27, he says to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So that is what he's saying right here is that God made the Sabbath to give people time to rest. But uh, in addition to all of their rules and everything that they were saying you had to do in addition to just resting, uh, the Pharisees had, had in fact made the Sabbath the master over people instead of it being a benefit to people. So in instead of joining the Sabbath as rest, a time to worship, a time to give your animals rest, a time for you to rest, now they had to work even harder to make sure that they weren't breaking all these extra rules that the Pharisees had put on them. And so they had inverted the whole meaning of what Sabbath was intended to be. And then he makes this shocking statement. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, you need to look at the, the construction of the sentence of this to really get what he is saying. So now, already in chapter 2, last week we talked about he has identified his him, Jesus, as the Son of Man. This is a title he's given to himself. And so uh, he's saying the Son of Man is Lord. Now stop right there. Don't go any further. The Son of Man is Lord. Now, in the Greek, Lord is kurios, which means possessor, owner, the supreme one. So Jesus, he's saying uh, there that he is the Son of Man, is Lord, that is the supreme one, implied here over everything here, including the Sabbath. Now, where did the Sabbath get established? At creation, right? The reason that we rested and he gives us a Sabbath rest is because he rested six days of creation and then he rested on the Sabbath. So where was the Sabbath made a law? Mount Sinai, right? That's where it came into law and the Ten Commandments. It's right in there. Remember the Sabbath day? Keep it holy. So either way you look at it, at its establishment, or its implementation, the Sabbath was created by Almighty God. None other. So the deep answer to their question was really, really quite shocking. He says, why don't your disciples that follow the Sabbath rules? I'm the Lord. I make the rules. That's what the answer was. <laughs> and Jesus issues a clear and unmistakable claim to be creator, lawgiver, and supreme one. And as such, he decides what the rules are for Sabbath and everything else. So, remember, he doesn't say, I'm just Lord of the Sabbath here. It says he's Lord. Sabbath just comes under the, uh, the comprehensive authority that he has over everything else. And that leads us to the last conflict and com uh, question, and this is in Mark chapter 3. I have no idea why the people who divided chapters and verses way back whenever didn't put this together because clearly it goes together. So we're just going to cover the first six verses of chapter 3 tonight because here, um, Jesus, what he does here is he follows up this statement of being Lord over the Sabbath with some practical evidence that he is indeed Lord over the, uh, over, over the Sabbath and that he is the supreme one. So, uh, so the question is, which Sabbath activity honors God more? And this is verses in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So once again, the Pharisees are stalking Jesus. And it says right there in verse 2 that the whole point, they were, look, they were looking at him and watching everything he did so they could accuse him. And so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And so they were looking for a way to trap him. Because in their laws... It was okay if you helped somebody who was um, had an accident or was, you know, something, an emergency that, that you could step in and help them, whatever they needed, that was okay. But if it was not a life-threatening situation, then you needed to wait till tomorrow to do it. You're not going to do it on, on a Sabbath, you just need to wait. And a man with a shriveled hand, like this incident, would be one of those things. So if they were expecting Jesus to follow their rules and to just ignore this man on the Sabbath. Now, the parallel verse in Matthew, chapter 12, verse 10, tells us that the, the uh, Pharisees started this whole uh, confrontation with a question. And they said, is it lawful, that is according to the law, to heal on the Sabbath? So, back in our verses in Mark, chapter 3, 
he, Jesus says to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everybody. And so Jesus heard their question. He knew what they were, that they were trying to trap him. And he steps up, has this man stand in front of them to directly challenge them. And so Jesus issues a counter question. And what he says is, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? And so what he does here is changes the point from, is it legal, because that's what they asked, is it lawful, to is it moral? Not uh, what do traditions demand, what do your laws say, but what is right? What is closer to the, uh, uh, more consistent with the law of Moses and the spirit of the law of Moses and closer to the heart of God? And so they don't say anything. He says they remain silent. That's because the answer is obvious, right? They're trapped by their own trap. Now, the irony here is, don't miss this, is that these keepers of the law uh, who are looking for a way to accuse Jesus of being a law breaker are themselves plotting to do something that is clearly outside of the Ten Commandments, and that is they are plotting to murder an innocent man on the Sabbath. <laughs> and they are really looking, uh, and so Jesus is really looking inside their hearts at their motives and, and challenging their, their thought processes rather than defending what he and his disciples were doing there. And so um, it says here that he looked around them at them in anger and was distressed at their stubborn hearts and then he just says to the man stretch out your hand and he is healed and it's interesting enough that you need to note here that Jesus doesn't do anything that can be considered work in this moment right because that's the accusation right will Jesus do work on the Sabbath and, and so but so, but he doesn't make a potion he doesn't uh, uh, rub the man man's hand. He doesn't do any kind of massage or anything on him. He doesn't lift anything. All he does is tell the man to stretch out his hand and he's healed. So, and the man is miraculously healed. And, and, but instead of going, wow, look at that. He healed this man without doing any work at all. Let's rejoice in this great move of God. They become hardened. And our last verse for tonight is that the Pharisees then went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And that word for plot there really means began conspiring, which is implies continuous, ongoing action over and over and over again. So this is not a one-time meeting with them. We'll see the Herodians show up later on as we cover the rest of the Gospel of Mark. But they are working together over and over and over to uh, find a way to get rid of of Jesus and so and they're so angered by what Jesus has done here and his uh, refusal to follow their laws that they conspire with these Herodians and just briefly the Herodians are polar opposites polar opposites they're, they normally wouldn't have anything to do with each other the Herodians as their name suggests were followers and supporters of King Herod uh, specifically they love uh, all the political parts of Rome the very political group uh, not interested in God, religion, any of that kind of stuff, so they were opposites. It's almost unthinkable that they're even talking to each other, but they hear they're plotting on the Sabbath to commit a murder. Clearly, not God's will ever. So that's where we're going to end tonight, but there is a huge takeaway for us at the end of these three sections here, and uh, so the clash between Jesus and the Pharisees tonight was out of the rules, right? That they kept bringing up, why are you doing this? And why don't you do that? And on and on and on. It was, they couldn't figure out why Jesus wasn't behaving according to their rules. But it's not about rules. And it's not about our rules today either. Not about any of the things we tend to get so worked up about, especially surrounding church, right? Like order of service or music or format or what they're wearing or what they're doing over there. And why don't they follow these rules over here? And all that stuff is on the outside is just like the Pharisees. And we don't like to think of ourselves as being like that, but sometimes we can just drift right into that mindset really quickly that is all about the outside. So the point is not about rules, it's about who rules. That's the real question right there. It's a question we have to answer for ourselves individually. 
Mark's gospel, up until this point, even this very short time that we've been in this study, doesn't leave room for us to just consider Jesus as a good teacher or a compassionate uh, man. He doesn't let us pick and choose what we want to do, what we don't want to do when it comes to the scripture. Doesn't let us decide who, uh, uh, doesn't let us decide, do our cultural rules, do our cultural standpoints and our standards uh, match what we think the scriptures ought to say. We don't get to toss out what we don't like. That's just not what he, these verses and what we see Jesus is and who Jesus is. We don't get to end there. We have to look at Jesus' clear claim to be God and the evidence of his actions that demonstrate the truthfulness of what he said. And then our, we have to respond. Our agreement that he is Lord demands something from us to move toward him in obedience in surrender or like the Pharisees to stiffen and move away. So there really isn't any middle ground. The reminder from these first three sections of Mark here is that he is God. He will not be diminished. He is not just our best friend, though he says he is our friend. He's not just a good guy, not just a good teacher, but clearly as these chapters show us, he is the Lord. He is the creator. He is the lawgiver. He is the supreme one over all. So we have to take a minute and we have to ask ourselves, what has our attention? What has your attention that has caused his glory to be diminished in your life? What is it that has caused you to reorient around something else, something less than who he is? So after you have uh, studied this part of Mark, I hope you're diving in it for yourself and reading and thinking about what it says here, what these words really mean. Have you, after three weeks in this wonderful book, began to look up at Jesus in a new way? Have you begun to see just how Mark describes him? Has he begun to make a new impression on you? You may be in church all your life, ever since you were just a little kid, but if this is a new understanding for you, are you starting to see him in a different light? Please talk to your group leaders or talk to somebody who is a spiritual mentor to you because this is the most important thing you need to understand in all of life. So, it, but if you do know Jesus as Lord, if you would say, yes, he is the Son of Man, he is Lord, then there's a question for you to answer to. And it's a fill in the blank question. The Son of Man is Lord even of what? What goes in that blank for you? Is it your past? Is he Lord of your past? Is he, is he Lord over your disappointments, your hopes, your dreams, your relationships, your expectations, your career, your pain? Is he Lord over all of those things? Or maybe there, you know exactly what goes in that blank or what needs to go in that blank do you need what is it do you need to stop or what is it you need to start or what is it you need to follow all the way through on in light of him being lord the supreme one he is lord that's just a declaration of fact but the truth is we have to decide are we willing to set our rights the rights we think we have to set them aside and give him the right to rule and reign over all that I believe is mine. So we're going to finish up tonight. I'm going to give you a few minutes to just open up your heart. Open up your mind, your thinking, your attitude, the way you've been living. Open up everything. And in light of who he is, in light of his authority that we have seen, with a new openness, come 
David saying to him, you have the rightful authority over all of my life. And I now open my hands voluntarily on these areas of compromise, the things I've held on to, the things I've wrestled with over and over and over and over again. Because you are the creator. You are Lord. I acknowledge that. So I'm going to just take just a minute to talk to him and for uh, to ask him for his grace and his mercy. Because the truth is, he, anytime we come to him, he moves toward us with infinite love and with infinite peace and with his infinite willingness to accept us just as we are, but not leave us there, to move us forward to where he wants us to be. So I ask you, as you pray here, surrender your rights. Let him have the authority that is rightfully his. Uh, and commit yourself to live in a way that is pleasing and that will honor him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So just bow your head and close your eyes for a few minutes. Lord, thank you that you reveal yourself as the Supreme One. Thank you that you are full of grace and mercy and patience and kindness and love and that you hear us when we turn toward you. God, give us the strength to give up those things we want to hold on to, to lay down the things that you ask us to lay down knowing that your way is always the best way. God, we just trust you with whatever is the most precious and the most dear to us. And we just ask you that you would give us the strength to take the first step toward you. The first step tonight, either in original faith and trust in you, or first step toward a new life of surrender and trust and obedience to you. We pray this all in your son's mighty name. Amen.